I have done this a couple, I think this is my third year here that I've done this. Have any of you actually come to, to this session before? One? Anybody else? Um, okay, well, welcome back, thank you, and I'll try to get you some new information. In fact, I, 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 this was intending to build on kind of prior years in that I wanted to talk about changes that occurred. And there have been a fair amount of changes that have occurred just in the past year, but in the past few years. So if you've, if you've gotten familiar with special needs trusts over the years and, uh, and you're still learning about ABLE accounts, ABLE accounts haven't been around two years yet in Florida. July 1st will be two years that we've even had them as an option. And so we'll talk about that, but um, we'll talk about the fact that this, uh, in December with the, I forgot what they ended up calling it, but the Tax Cuts Something Act, whatever the federal act was that was signed in December, made three changes to the ABLE law as it existed. Um, this past legislative session in Florida in March, they made some significant changes to the ABLE program here in Florida. Um, we have been th knowing for, for, for about a year to a year and a half now that Social Security was rewriting all of the policy regarding special needs trusts, and that's where the policy even for Florida Special Needs Trust Administration comes from, which is the Social Security Administration, because as I think Felicia did yesterday, a great program about SSI, SSDI, and these public benefits, which is great because now I don't need to get into the details of that. In fact, her, her slideshow and her materials get into it, so uh, mine have a little bit about that, so I'm going to be able to kind of skip through some of that, but I want to give you, because I know a lot of you are lawyers, I want to give you the background of where the law is if you do want to go and learn more about it. But the um, the policy is the big part of it. There's, there is the federal statute, but the federal statute regarding some of these trusts is, is like three paragraphs, and that's about it. There's not much to it, and there are no federal regulations regarding special needs trusts. It's all left at the next level, which is policy, and policy is uh, mostly um, Social Security. There's some policy over at CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and, uh, and actually now with ABLE accounts, what's interesting is all that policy is written by the the um, commissioner of the IRS. It's a, it's a tax code, which is different because there's hardly any public benefits programs that are set forth in the tax code like ABLE is. And, and I'll explain a little bit more about that. But it's interesting how these different, you know, at this point federal agencies are, are, are um, interpreting things. And in fact, how Social Security may have a little bit of inter different interpretation than the IRS on ABLE accounts. But, um, but there has been since 1993 when um, these uh, exceptions to the general rule that all trusts count for all public benefits programs like SSI and Medicaid, that's the general rule, trusts count. In 1993 when they, they passed the, um, uh, it was part of an omnibus bill, but it was, uh, it was part of the budget basically, the idea was they were trying to cut people out from using trusts. Up until then people were using, they, they would take their money, they put it into a trust and then they would put some restrictions on the use of those funds and then if the restrictions were done correctly, the trust didn't count anymore for SSI and for Medicaid. And so their whole plan was to, to stop that and say, you can't do that anymore. And then they had to say, well, we've got some exceptions to those rules, and that's that some of these special needs trusts we're going to talk about are those exceptions to the rules. Oh, I don't forget. I put at the corner of each, um, each little row um, just some simple handouts. In fact, every, the, there's, there's just two pages front and back. It's in the written materials, too, but I wanted to give you something to kind of look at and refer to, because I know sometimes my materials are like, there's, there's three sets of materials, which the PowerPoint is one of them. It's like 120 pages or so, and it's a lot to it, but if you want to know and learn, I've done a whole outline of the background of these trusts and how they work in a lot of detail, but we kind of reduced them down to, I like flowcharts, I like pictures, I like trying to explain and understand things using pictures. So the, the first page is actually the handout that I use for my clients. Um, I, I only deal with clients. I'm a private practice lawyer. That's one thing that's different for me than I don't, I don't do anything in dependency court or 
but um, but, I'm, but I'm learning, and I, and I want to do more of that. But uh, most of who I work with is, is people out in the private um, in the private sector. I'm working with families and helping them plan for the future of their child with special needs. I'm helping adults with special needs um, understand what programs are available, understand how APD works, understand how Social Security works, understand what Medicaid and Medicaid waiver programs are out there. How are we going to help cover their future living expenses, whether it be medical or housing, transportation, those kinds of things, and that's a big part of what you all do, too, as an advocate for, for children with special needs. Now, I know, you know, I don't know what percentage of, of each person that you deal with it has a person, is, it, is, it, is an individual with a disability, because you're dealing with all, all these other kids, too. And, and I, I do work with those families and just do kind of traditional estate planning, but the, the vast majority of my clients are all have a child or a loved one with special needs. Um, I do get those calls, though, and I do work with some who don't have parents. Um, a lot of times um, we end up getting involved because a parent has died and all of a sudden, unexpectedly, many times, and maybe there's some money, there's a life insurance policy, there's some resources now that this child is going to inherit. And if the child has no special needs, well, there's a process for that. There's guardianship, you go to guardianship court, you get a guardian of the property appointed until they're an adult, and then when they get to be an adult, you go, here you go, don't blow it all in one place, right? That's, that's what typically happens. But what if that child has autism or Down syndrome or some other intellectual or developmental disability? The first issue might be um, they have some medical coverage we need to maintain right off the bat, and if they inherit this $5,000 or $10,000 or $100 or a $1 million, whatever the case may be, life insurance policy or, or other assets, it's going to be a problem. And so we need to actually protect it now, but then it, it could be that we're looking to um, protect them um, so that these funds can be managed by someone who's capable, who's not going to be easily influenced, um, taken advantage of, those kinds of things. So, uh, so that's kind of what we're going to talk about. I'm going to give you uh, some big picture things about special needs trusts, since, since for a lot of you it's the first time that you've heard this, at least from me. Um, but I do want to get into the updates. What's changed? Oh, the other thing was, um, like I said, we've known for about a year and a half that there were changes coming from Social Security. There are, um, there's a manual, if you're not familiar with it, um, it's called the POMS, P-O-M-S, it stands for Program Operations Manual System. It is the caseworker's reference guide for Social Security workers, and in there, there are sections dealing with Social Security Disability and SSI and different programs. And then inside of SSI, which is Supplemental Security Income Policy, where we're looking at all this, it talks about eligibility criteria. There's income criteria, there's asset or resource criteria. And then inside there, there's, okay, how do we treat trusts and, and what, what are the, how are they going to be viewed? Well, there's really, there's three primary chapters. I say chapters because each one is about 20 to 25 pages of an explanation of how do we treat different kinds of trusts. And, um, and we've known that they had rewritten it because the gentleman who wrote it retired from Social Security uh, about a year ago or so and said, yeah, I rewrote that, you know, like less than about a year ago and it should be coming out any time. And we've been saying it's going to come out, it's going to come out, it's going to come out. And so, of course, you know, my deadline came to get my materials in. I got my materials in. It's all good. And guess what happened on Monday? The new policy came out. It's done. What I, t what I did was, and I know you can't see it from back there. This is, I don't even know how many pages, 120, 130 pages. What I did is I took the old policy and I laid it over the new policy because when they, what, why is it when the government makes changes, they don't do like a strike version? Like, like in legislature, a lot of times when you're seeing a bill that's being changed, they do a strike out and if it's new language, it's in a different color. They don't do that. So I had to do that. Um, it wasn't real hard. I let, I let Microsoft and Bill Gates do it. I just save them in Word, and then I do a comparison. It actually does a really good job. And so everything that's read in here is, is change in policy. If you can't see, that whole page is red. That whole page is red. I mean, and so I've been, for the last three or four days, this has been my homework, is studying it. So I have read it all. We knew kind of what was going to be in there, because Ken Brown, who was the guy who wrote it with Social Security, was the head of policy in Baltimore for the SSI program, kind of told us at a couple of different programs and conferences. So none of that's in your materials, and I'll talk a little bit about, I did a, 
I did a summary that I'll give you the talking points. These are the summary of the, of the highlighted changes that, that I am going to talk about. So, so I want to save time to go over that because when I've submitted the materials, I was just going to be able to talk kind of in theoretical terms that, well, we're expecting it's going to say this, or we're told it's going to do that. Well, now we know exactly what it is. And it's policy. It's effective technically as of, although I didn't see it until Tuesday, which was May 1st. It says it was April 30th is when the policy becomes effective. So that's a whole new set of information for us to learn. There's, there's some changes, not major, major changes, but there are some changes in it, some clarifications. And as a general um, statement, it's all better than it was, which is kind of amazing, right? They actually changed something and made it better. They actually relaxed a lot of the, what we thought were some limitations and restrictions on how these trusts can work and how they go. So with that, I'm going to, uh, we'll start off with a talk about special needs trusts first, uh, a little bit about public benefits, but because that's been, been covered in another session, I'm not going to go into great detail. Um, and then I'm going to talk about ABLE accounts, and in particular some of the changes that have been made over the past year or so, because they've only been around two years. But we'll also just kind of give you a good introduction uh, as to what they are. I think, I think there's a really good chance that your the tool that's going to be best used by you between a special needs trust and an ABLE account for the individuals you're working with with a disability are going to be ABLE accounts. There's, they're new, but I do think that for many of your cases, they're going to be a much better alternative, and I'll explain why that is and how, how you learn and know more about it. But, um, but they're still, still new, and they're still fine-tuning um, some of the policy. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. So just from the bigger picture standpoint, what are special needs trusts, just as a big picture? And, and the thing is, you, you deal with so many individuals with special needs and disabilities that unfortunately will never benefit from a special needs trust because there's no money for them. There's no, well, be, I, I was uh, talking to some folks at, at lunch, like, well, where's the money come from? I'm like, well, it's gotta come, it doesn't come from the government to go into a special needs trust. It's somebody along the way wants to leave some money for this individual or, very likely what you see is that there's a lawsuit and money is recovered for the individual. So how many of those people do you see? One in what, 50, one in 100? I don't know, but they're there. And so when you see one, you'll, you'll, you'll know, okay, well, this is something I need to consider. So one common thread is that, that most of everybody has some kind of a disability. Of course, there's different kinds of trusts that aren't special needs that might just be for a minor until they're an adult or a spendthrift type of a trust. I'm, my kid's not responsible. I don't want them to get the money until they're 25 or 30 or 35, something like that. That's a little bit different. But basically, the idea of a special needs trust is that it's going to be exempted when we go to look for eligibility for programs that have a financial test to them. And then there are many programs that don't have a financial test, and I'll talk just briefly about some of those, because it, it, you do need to have, if you didn't go to the Social Security um, overview program yesterday, you need to have a little bit of that basic understanding. But, um, but we're looking maybe for some benefits through Social Security. We're also looking for medical coverage and Medicaid, which I know most of the people you work with, uh, most of the kids, are eligible for Medicaid. Medicaid, but that's just health insurance Medicaid. What if they have significant um, medical needs that require unique types of services? They have cerebral palsy, they have um, spina bifida, some program that you need to look at maybe getting them onto a Medicaid waiver type program to get some specialized services, a traumatic brain injury or spinal cord injury. Those, um, there's a special Medicaid program for that, cystic fibrosis, HIV AIDS, there's a whole bunch of them. And so those, those have some eligibility criteria. And the idea is if there's a program out there that's going to do something, we want it to do it. And we're going to use this money to give them a better quality of life than they would have had otherwise. How cool is that, right? I mean, shouldn't every child with a disability have a special needs trust? Wouldn't it be great if there was some money they say, okay, well, I understand. Incidentally, um, there's an interesting study. And I think oh, it, was, um, it was the keynote speaker yesterday. It was somebody asked the question about, you know, what can we do in Florida to get more services for our kids with special needs? And I didn't want to burst anybody's bubbles or, or raise my hand, but there's a, um, there's a study by the University of Colorado. It's called State of the States. This isn't in my material. No, I'm just off, off topic, which I do that sometimes. It's called State of the States. Every year they do an evaluation of all 50 states plus the District of Columbia and how well they're doing in serving people with intellectual and 
developmental disabilities. They look at total budgets, they look at how much of your state budget, what percentage goes to these services, they look at how much of the services are provided in the community as opposed to institutional, they look at what you spend per individual um, that you serve in the state, in each state. And on that last subject, how much Florida spends per individual. This is now not even, you know, how many we serve when we have 20,000 people on the waiting list for our um, program through the Agency for Persons with Disabilities, but of the people we serve, how well do you think Florida does on just what we spend per individual compared to 49 other states plus the District of Columbia? So there's possible 51. We could, you know, one, or are we at 51? 50th. Very, very close. You said 49. We are 50th out of 51 states in what we spend. It's pretty sad. No, a lot of people try to guess what the 51st one is. I'll tell you a little bit. I'll tell you. No, DC is toward the top. Washington, DC spends per capita um, incredibly more money than, than the state of Florida does. In fact, so much so that the ARC that I'm, I, I'm on our, our foundation board over in Pinellas County, the ARC Tampa Bay, um, we actually are recruiting people from DC to come down to be served in our in our facility because the reimbursement rate is like 12 times what we get for the same basic services. So those three or four people we have that we serve from DC can cover like 25% of the budget. It's amazing. So no, it's Nevada, by the way. Thank God for Nevada. They spend less than we do. But it's sad because we don't have a lot. So this is why it's so important to have a trust where we can have other money that goes for other things. So that's the idea is we're trying to enhance the quality of life for the individual. So just briefly, because we could talk for an hour, which I think was done yesterday on basically these programs, but there's a couple of different ways you get a check from Social Security. Many of you might know the SSDI, Social Security Disability Insurance. If you remember that the I and SSDI is insurance, you don't get insurance unless you pay for it. Right? You get a welfare if you don't pay for it, but insurance is something you've got to pay for. And the way you pay for it is you work and you pay your taxes. And then you become disabled and you can't work anymore, and you can start drawing on your retirement benefits early. Well, also, you actually are buying a disability policy, in essence, from the federal government for your dependents, too. So if, as I'm working, if I become disabled and I can't work anymore and I've paid enough into the system, I start getting a disability check, and my minor children, will get a check because they're minors and they're dependents. My sons will stop next year when he turns 18, unless he's still in, in, in um, high school up until age 19, but his would stop. My daughters would continue. My daughter's 14. Hers would continue up until she's 18, and then at, at age 18, we would just reapply and have her determined disabled because she has Down syndrome, and she would continue getting that check the rest of her lifetime. So there's dependence checks. That's actually what a DAC check is, a disabled adult child check. That's for m all minor children get a check when mom or dad are either deceased or drawing Social Security. Okay, Deceased or drawing Social Security. You could be getting Social Security retirement, which we used to refer to that as the Tony Randall rule, who at like 80 years old became a father. So if you're already getting Social Security retirement, your child gets a Social Security check because they're dependent on you until they're 18 or 19 if they're in school. But if you become disabled, it triggers that check as well. And then when you pass away, the child, the minor children get the check to 18. Um, if they're disabled, it keeps going for their lifetime. And it's based upon what the parent put in. So you don't need per se, to have a special needs trust for the disabled adult child benefit or the SSDI check. That's based upon paying for it. You bought it. If I, get, if I become disabled, they're not going to ask me how much money I have in the bank before they're going to tell me whether I can get a disability check. They're going to say, did you work? Did you get your 40 quarters? And if so, you get it. Um, SSI is different. Supplemental security income is a social security check for a person who can't get a social security check any other way, and they're disabled or they're 65 or older. So a person who's never been married, never worked, um, not disabled, but's here in the United States legally, at age 65 can get an SSI check because they're considered aged. So at 65, you automatically get it. You don't have to be disabled. If you're under 65, you can get a check if you're disabled, whether you're a minor or an adult. You can get a check. Um, but 
There's financial criteria for it. And what happens with most of our minor children is that until they're 18, their mother or father's resources are deemed to them. They count against them. So if mom or dad have too much money, even a severely disabled child might not be eligible for SSI because there's counting of mom and dad's income and resources. But the day that child turns 18, the deeming stops even if the child still lives at home with them. And that's what I'm talking with families about. And then this is a little different because you're like, well, our kids don't have parents for the most part, but the parents may be disabled or may have passed away. And so we need to understand that these programs are out there. But, um, but if we're looking at just the child by themselves, if there are no parents, if the child has no money or not much, then they could be getting SSI even as a minor, as long as they have a disability that meets Social Security's criteria that's expected to last into adulthood that would prevent them from going out and working and engaging with what they call substantial gainful activity. And I think Felicia went over all that yesterday. It's $1,180 a month. Is, is called, that's a current substantial gainful activity. So you, we all know that there's, we go, we go shop at Publix. We all see people in Publix with disabilities and special needs. Mine is great. My, we have, I, I walk in there and I see my clients in there. So I have a couple of my clients who work at my local Publix. And I go in and I check on them, see how they're doing. And they make money. And they still get these benefits because it's not enough for them to live on by themselves. But it's great for them to have a job. So SSI is our big one, and that's also why, where the policy is for all this. It's under the SSI rules, so Social Security. Basically, it's a $2,000 resource limit in what are called countable resources. Um, a lot of things don't count, like a home and a car and, and a few other things, but, but cash in the bank does, a personal injury settlement does, an inheritance that's not planned correctly does. All those can be an issue. So that's what we'd want to look at in a special needs trust for. Then we have some, again, big picture stuff. We have medical coverages. Uh, many of you know about Medicare. That's our retirees who have worked and, again, paying your taxes, gets you into the Medicare system. So if you vest enough for retirement, you actually um, can start drawing Medicare at 65 still. You can't draw it early at 62 like you can your Social Security retirement. Um, you can get Medicare earlier if you're disabled and you've paid into the system. Um, after a, basically a two-year waiting period, there's, for most conditions, it's, um, you have to wait two years. There's a couple of exceptions that if you're so severe, if your diagnosis is so bad that you become disabled because you have, say, ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, or end-stage renal failure, you automatically get Medicare if that's your disabling event. But Medicare, generally speaking, doesn't have any financial criteria. You know? Warren Buffett gets Medicare, right? Billionaire, because he paid for it. But put money in the taxes, so there's no financial criteria. People with disabilities, um, sons and daughters who are getting that disabled adult child check on mom or dad's work history, after two years, they get Medicare. They can win the lottery and they're not going to lose their Medicare and they're not going to lose their Social Security disability check. If they had SSI, they would. And then we have Medicaid, which a lot of you are familiar with, but you need to realize there's lots of versions of Medicaid, but all of them have some kind of a financial limitation to them, so that if you have too much money in the bank, again, why would you have money? You inherited some money, you got a personal injury award, those are the two big ones that you're probably going to deal with. You can jeopardize the program, so that's where a special needs trust can be used to shelter. We have those waiver programs, which I mentioned about four or five of them just a little bit ago, the one that the Agency for Persons with Disabilities administers, which I don't even know what they actually are calling it these days. They kind of call it the I-budget, but I don't think the I-budget's ever actually formally been adopted. They tried and they lost a couple of court cases and they went back to the drawing board. But it's, um, it's the program for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, and then those others, cystic fibrosis, HIV AIDS, traumatic brain injury, spinal cord. There's these waiver programs that are specifically designed to meet the unique needs of a diagnosis. And so they have limitations. And then now we have still, it's still around, the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, private health insurance. That is um, it's still an option, and, and up until you know, seven or eight years ago, it wasn't an option because you, you couldn't buy a policy for an individual that had all these pre-existing conditions. There were all these exclusions. Well, now you still can't um, exclude people for pre-existing conditions. You've got to be able to afford it. If they don't have any income, you're not going to get the tax credits, because that was part of the big idea of it, was that the federal government would, would subsidize some of that. But there is, there is an option for private insurance, and certainly group pl plans are still available. You know, if your parents, did you have a question? 
Yeah, yeah, great question. So yes, the, um, the, D, the, the Medicare being triggered back to a DAC benefit, yes, it's from the date the child becomes eligible for the DAC, there's a 24 month waiting period before the child would get Medicare, but they would get Medicare. Um, and what typically happens is, I'm gonna go back a slide just for a second. So what, typic, what, what, what I see most of the time, which is maybe not what you're gonna deal with, um, I have a mom and dad, or a mom or dad, who is taking care of the kid, and they come to see me and they go, can my five-year-old with autism or, or, uh, or Down syndrome, can they get a check here? And we start looking at these things, you all know your child's never worked, the parents aren't drawing a social security check, they're still alive, so no, other than SSI, can they qualify for SSI? Well, the child has no money, but the parent does, and so Deeming says no. So I say no, they're eligible for any of these checks right now, but at age 18, come back in because there's no more Deeming. Kids still not gonna be eligible for disability because you're still not gonna be retired, and let's assume you're still alive, um, and let's assume you're not disabled. The kid starts getting an SSI check, and we start going through that process, and as many of you know, because I know it was again mentioned yesterday, Receipt of SSI in the state of Florida automatically triggers Medicaid for an individual. So Medicaid is tied with SSI. Medicare is tied with Social Security Retirement. It's also tied with SSDI, Social Security Disability Insurance, and it's tied with that disabled adult child benefit as well. So they, then they, they go on, to Medi so on SSI and Medicaid, and then the parent retires, or they become disabled, or they die. And then we flip off of, and, and technically they could still be eligible for SSI if their check based on mom or dad's work history isn't large enough. The maximum is $750 in Florida, so the child's check is generally 50% of whatever mom or dad's check is. So if mom or dad's social security check is $1,000, the kid's gonna get 500, Mom, mom and dad still get their full thousand. There's no diminishing of that. But that's still not 750, so you can actually get two checks. And as long as you still get an SSI check, you get Medicaid. And then you also start your 24 month waiting period for Medicare. And then when Medicare kicks in, it becomes primary and Medicaid becomes secondary. But what if the check is, is $2,000 that mom or dad get, and the child's check is 1000 Okay, now technically the child is over the SSI limit, so they're gonna get the $1,000 DAC check, and normally you would think that they would lose their Medicaid because they're not eligible for SSI anymore, but the materials yesterday talked about protected Medicaid. So that child then is now grandfathered into Medicaid, the same Medicaid they had before, as long as they stay eligible in every other way, except the fact that their income is too high now because they're getting a social security check on, on somebody else's work history. So it's complicated. That, that's what I said, we could talk about this for hours and never get to special needs trusts. But I'm trying to give you, when it's Medicaid, Medicaid waiver, those are the programs that we typically want to look for. And SSI and Medicaid, they have, um, they have resource limits. Um, they have level of care, which means you gotta medically qualify. Um, in Florida, you can't get Medicaid unless you are poor and fall into another category of, of eligibility, of, of, of criteria, like you're a child, or you are a parent of a minor child, or you're pregnant, or you're 65 or older. If you're just a healthy 25-year-old guy who's down on his luck and can't get a job and has no money and needs medical coverage, you can't get Medicaid in Florida. So there's medical need as well. We didn't expand Medicaid under Medicaid expansion. That was um, one of the things that Florida opted not to do. So there are these resource limits, so you can't have money. And basically for SSI and most Medicaid programs, it's $2,000. Some Medicaid programs have a $5,000 limit. In fact, my next slide, which will be very, very hard for you to see, especially in the back, has all of those limitations as to what they are. But generally speaking, you can't have much money and be eligible for these programs, and you can't give the money to somebody else to hold on to for you. Transfers or gifts are penalized. And as I mentioned before, the general rule is all trusts count. 
So the matter of, of getting to, okay, how do we exclude trusts? This is the chart that I said is going to be very difficult. Actually, maybe a little bit. I can, I can zoom this too. So these, these programs have some limitations to them. And, and so most of them, um, the columns, That column are the resource limits for the programs. $2,000, we can see the, the low income subsidy for um, extra help with, with prescriptions is $14,000, but it's like $5,000, and the ones down at the bottom are our long term care and our waiver programs. So those are, um, are difficult to qualify for. And so, as a general rule, again, trusts are going to count. So then our question is okay, well, what are the exceptions to the trusts? And this is where uh, I've got now the, the information that you have. I, I will eventually get to this, um, this little chart that's on the very, very back page in, in a few minutes. But basically what you got to know is there are, there are two types of trust that fall into two very broad categories. And the, the basic criteria is you got to know what's the source of the money. Is it the individual's money already? They, they, it's, it's their recovery in a lawsuit. Um, the inheritance has already been given to them. It wasn't planned or headed off or uh, it wasn't directed to go into a trust. Those are called our self-settled trusts. There's a different set of rules that apply to them. Because we don't want, I mean, why should the individual be able to have a you know, million dollar personal injury settlement and still keep all of these benefits that are tied to being poor? So there's a different set of rules for that. The third party is the other kind. That's anybody other than the beneficiary or their spouse um, will, um, can, can put money into a trust. That's a parent. That's a grandparent. That's an aunt or uncle. It's a who knows who. It could be lots of different individuals, but those are our two broad categories. I'm going to take the second one first because it's the easy one, third party. If it's not the beneficiary's money, if we're working with a parent or a grandparent and they want to put money in trust for their, their loved one with special needs, great. Those are the best kind, right? You got somebody with money and they got somebody who needs it. So it's a family member can set it up. Um, you set up a trust. There's lots of different ways to do it, but basically it says, I'm going to put it into a trust. This person is it's going to be there for them. It's, going to, it's not going to interrupt their program that they might be eligible for. It's going to give them a better quality of life. Um, a lot of times you hear about special needs trusts and having to have these Medicaid payback provisions to them. Keep in mind that does not apply to this kind of trust. There's no Medicaid lien or payback against these funds when a beneficiary passes away. So it can be, I leave it to my daughter, and if there's anything left in there when she dies, it goes to my son. If it doesn't go to them, it goes to my grandkids, or it goes, to my, it goes wherever you want it to go, 100% of what's left. There's no diminishing by Medicaid or other, um, um, other programs that the individual may have received. And I mentioned, you know, wh why would, uh, you know, so, let me, so why would the individual have money of, on their own? The self-settled trusts are the more complicated ones. These must be irrevocable, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, this could be an inheritance, it could be a personal injury award. In some of the cases we see, because I'm dealing with elderly population as well, is that people have worked and saved, and then now they had a stroke, or they have dementia, and they're facing long-term care um, to the tune of nine to $10,000 a month, and they're doing the math real quick, and they're like, I'm gonna run out of money, like in a year or two, and my spouse isn't gonna have anything, and there won't be anything left then for my, my kids or my family, or maybe my child with special needs. What do I do? There's a whole industry, obviously, of elder law attorneys that advise how to navigate these programs and these systems. So just so remember now, we're talking that the person has some money already, and we're either on one of those programs and we want to maintain it, or we're trying to get on it for the first time. And so there's all these sets of rules. This is now well, these are called self-settled trusts, and it's kind of small, but. Remember I said there's a couple of different federal agencies that write the policy and the rules. Well, 42 United States Code is the Social Security Act. 26 United States Code is the Internal Revenue Code. So for special needs trusts, we're in the Social Security Act. So inside the Social Security Act, there are specific statutes that deal with these. And I have them highlighted because you may hear these terms referred to the trusts, because they're often referred to, oh, that's a D4A, or that's a D4C, which is a pooled trust. 
that's the section of the federal law where they're found. And remember, they were added in in 1993 because when they, in 1993, the federal government said, we want to stop the use of trusts. People are setting up trusts and qualifying for these programs. They said, we're going to stop that. But then they said, but then we've got three exceptions. And these are the three exceptions that we, that we deal with all the time. So we have to fit into one of the exceptions. And we're going to take each of them, not in great detail, but each of them um, so that you know a little bit more about them. But again, I, I, I give you that reference because that's what they're commonly referred to. The first one is the D4A, which is a, um, a self-settled trust. As it, the, the slide before indicated, it can only be set up for a person who's under the age of 65. Um, if they set one up before they're 65 and then they turn 65, it's still exempted, but they can't fund it anymore after they're 65. Um, remember I said it was 1993. So that law passed in 1993 and it, it remained unchanged until December 13th of 2016. Um, was the first amendment that was made to it. So how many years that is? What, 23 years? Is that right? Something like that. Um, so what was changed was, under the original law, an individual beneficiary who was capable and competent, maybe an adult with a brain injury or a spinal cord injury, let's say, who's a, a paraplegic at, at 30 years old, but whose, whose mind still worked fine, um, couldn't establish one of these trusts on their own. They had to go through some other criteria, like a parent, a grandparent, legal guardian, or the court to do it. So in December of 2016, they changed the law to say the individual can actually establish their own trust now. So any competent adult who's disabled can establish one of these trusts and then again allow the funds to go in there. But because this is the individual's money, these trusts have a mandatory Medicaid payback when the individual passes away. We don't pay back SSI or the checks you get from Social Security. We don't pay back Medicare after death, but Medicaid is different. So when an individual agrees to receive Medicaid benefits, the state, in whatever state they've received Medicaid, it could, they could move from state to state, but in, if they're in Florida, the state of Florida becomes a creditor of theirs when they pass away. Well, oftentimes there's no money anyway, right? They're poor, that's why they're on Medicaid. But these trusts are a little different where there can be money that's, that's in there and then the individual beneficiary passes away and then we have to see how much the state has paid out. Um, the federal law says for the lifetime of the individual. Florida only enforces the trust lien from the day the trust was funded. So if the person had been on Medicaid for 20 or 30 years and then got a personal injury settlement and put money in trust, they're only going to um, lien the trust from the date that they, um, that they funded it. But there's a Medicaid payback. And if Medicaid is fully paid back, which does sometimes happen, then the money can go to other people, other family members or heirs or beneficiaries, but not until Medicaid is paid back. So that's, that's the basics for the D4A. statute limitations on how far back the the question is, for the, for the Medicaid lien, um, and, and the, no, there's not a limitation because the federal law says all Medicaid benefits for the lifetime of the beneficiary. Florida only goes from the day the trust is funded, but it's up to the trustee, because this isn't done typically in the probate estate, there's not, a, there's not a probate administration. The trust lien is a federal lien that requires it to be satisfied in probate laws, like, a two year, like if you were to wait two years to open an estate, a lot of times if you have creditors, you can wait two years and they're barred if they don't initiate a, an estate. It doesn't apply in the trust world. These are, these, this is a separate lien that's, that's granted. Um, now, ABLE accounts are a little different. We're going to have to talk about that. That's going to be interesting. So um, the D4C, incidentally, I'm not even going to talk about the, the, pool, the income trust, the D4B. We do have something called an income trust or a qualified income trust that only applies to our institutional programs like long-term care, Medicaid. Um, it doesn't apply to SSI. Um, that's when your income is a little bit over the, the income limit of the $2,250 a month is our current income limit, say, for nursing home program or one of the Medicaid waivers. 
You'll see some people with income greater than that, but not mostly with the children that you're dealing with, because they're going to be getting a survivor's benefit or a social security benefit. And unless they're like a child of a veteran and they're getting a, um, a pension plan or pension or something from the VA, they're not going to be over that. And that, that's, a, that's a special trust that we use just to deal with over income issues. The pool trust, though, is a little bit different than the D4A in that you don't have to be under the age of 65 um, to use it. You can be any age. I know most of your folks are going to be um, children, but, but um, you can be any age. And the idea is rather than having to set up a separate individual trust, you can do a pooled one that's already in existence. And under the federal law, the pooled trusts have to be established and overseen by a nonprofit corporation. And we have a fair number of them running and operating here in Florida. And in the interest of full disclosure, I run one of those called the Guardian Pool Trust. Um, we've been about 16, 17 years in existence. We've served about 2,000 individuals in the state of Florida and some outside. But the idea is that you maybe don't have enough money to go hire a big bank to be the trustee, and you don't have a family member that you trust or that's capable of managing it, maybe you got 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 thousand dollars and you need a professional. And so if you can pool those funds with other similarly situated individuals, you can do it cost effectively. A lot of times without a minimum fee, in fact most pool trusts don't have minimums, whereas your big banks and trust companies are going to have minimum fees, most of them. Some of them won't even take. There's one big bank who does a lot of special needs trust administration in Florida. Their minimum is a million dollars of investable funds. So if there's a house and some other things um, that total a million, not enough. They've got to have a million of investable funds before they're even going to accept it. And so it puts a lot of people out of that market. I mean, there's nice if there's a big, fat personal injury case or something, there's millions of dollars. But if it's smaller, the pool trusts are a lot more cost effective because they don't have minimums. OK. And I know I'd love to spend a lot more time. This chart, though, and, and this is now on the back of, your, um, of the handout. So this chart is something that's still a work in progress that I'm working on. But basically, it kind of gives you the uh, different options of, OK, so we, we want to look at, we need to do a trust because we've got some money. How do we know what our options are? And then that's why I said, you got to know whose money is it. If it's the beneficiary's money, now we're dealing with a D4A or a D4C. If it's somebody else's money, we're dealing with a third party trust. And this gives you some of the citations to some of the, the federal law where it's there. It gives you some of the advantages and maybe disadvantages of each. Like, well, the first party trusts, they have to have a Medicaid payback provision to them. Can't get around that. But whether we want to do an individual one or maybe we want to pool it. And um, to add another layer of confusion, um, we've developed a, a product to be able to pool third party money. So again, grandma and grandpa is great if they've got a bunch of zeros at the end of their balance sheet and they want to leave a trust for their grandchild. Um, they have a lot of options if they have, um, if they have lots of money. But if they want to leave fifty or $100,000, what are their options? Well, again, if we could pool those funds for administrative purposes, it can be a lot more cost effective. And this doesn't mean there's a Medicaid payback, because it's third party money, but it can be administered in a pooled environment. And so a lot of times, everybody knows the pooled is usually that D4C trust, and they think of it as a Medicaid payback. But we've basically taken that concept and applied it to third party money because it works. You can do it cost effective. You have professional money managers. You can have attorneys and people who practice overseeing that. Um, so the advantages, just briefly, you keep the benefit and the money. Um, and the disadvantages are um, those trusts have some limitations as to how the funds can be used. We're going to talk a little bit about that when we talk about some of the changes that they just published on, on Tuesday. Um, and it can be hard, like I mentioned, to find a trustee to oversee it. And we've got the Medicaid payback provisions if it's the first party money. So up until, well, in Florida, up until July 1st of 2016, so it'll be two years ago this July, if you had a child or an adult who, who needed to qualify for one of these programs and they had some extra money, this was about it. These were the options that you had. Your choice was a D4A or a D4C, whichever one I'm gonna, is, is going to make the most sense. Well, now you've got something new called ABLE accounts. They're not trusts. Be careful. There's a commercial product out there called Able Trust. If you go and Google it, you're going to find something that's totally different than what this is. 
ABLE accounts are part of federal law um, that, um, so, so the concept of an ABLE account is, okay, so um, my child, my first, my son's born, and I look at my wife, and we're like, got to get him through college, right? And that's your first thing, got to get him through college. So what do you do? You may do prepaid college or something, which is what we did. When my son Ethan was born, prepaid college, got to get him through college, we're done. And then my daughter comes along three years later, and I look at my wife, and I'm like, college isn't the goal anymore, right? So why can I do a prepaid college for my son? Or maybe do a 529 plan, some of you are familiar with that, it's a section of the Internal Revenue Code that lets me sock away a whole bunch of money the day your kid is born, if you want, and it grows tax-free as long as it's used for certain qualified educational expenses. Decent concept, right? Federal tax law, 529 of the Internal Revenue Code, that's where it is. So why should I be able to do that for my son with no special needs, and I can't do that with my daughter? Because maybe she doesn't need to go to college. Maybe, I'll, maybe she's gonna need transportation, housing, certain qualifying disability expenses that could actually be put in a full list that you're gonna see in a few minutes here. Why shouldn't we be able to do that? And so, um, this Stephen A. Beck, um, able achieving a better life experience, um, came about. It's actually in, like I mentioned before, it's in the Internal Revenue Code, 529A. <laughs> they just made it a, okay, well, we're gonna, we want to put it in the middle of 529, but it's not going to have anything to do with education, so it's called a 529A plan. It was signed by the president in December of 14, and then it, the, the, there's a whole lot of federal requir requirements, and I gave you a, um, one of the handouts that I have is a whole bunch of questions and answers. It's in the materials, not the one that you have. But although I do have a one little page overview of it here, but in the materials that I submitted, there's like a 20 some odd page um, question and answers. And I took it right off of Florida's ABLE um, website because it's a really good website. It says, you know, that's, that's all the questions that I think you might want to know the answers to, and I just copied it. I told them it was theirs. I didn't, I didn't, didn't steal it or anything. Um, so July 1st, so one of the requirements are that they have to be established and overseen by a state. And so your state had to go and do it. And believe it or not, Florida did it the first opportunity it had. I mean, it was passed in, in 14, and in 15, they actually, that legislative session, just a few months later, they enabled, they, they passed the enabling laws. And because it's like an education plan, right, well, who in Florida would be the logical people to oversee it? The Florida Prepaid College Board, the place that's holding my money for my son when I did the Florida Prepaid Plan. So they rolled it underneath Florida's Prepaid College Board. So it's administered in Tallahassee by the state. Um, and so the first year, so it started July 1st, and you could open accounts last, uh, two years ago. So the first year they said, okay, we're normally going to charge $2.50 a month to do the administration. We're going to waive the fees for the first year because we want people to, to, to learn about this. We want them to, to join it. And so July 1st of last year, it had been a year, they said, oh, that worked out so well. We're going to waive the fees again for another year. So they waived the $2.50 a month fees. And then, um, like in October, they're like, ah, we're just going to waive fees forever. So it doesn't cost you anything at all to put money into an ABLE account. And when you put it into the ABLE account, there are six, I think, six or seven investment options that you can pick from. You can have it kept in cash in a money market account, or you can have it invested in international funds and growth and income and all that. And you do pay an investment fee depending on how you choose to have it invested. But if you put it in a money market account and it's not really invested, then there's no fees at all. If you put it in the most aggressive account that's managed by Vanguard and BlackRock, which, I mean, they're doing like billions, if not trillions of dollars that they administer, um, Vanguard, Florida prepaid is, is billions, but Vanguard I think is a several trillion dollar company. Um, I think they charge like 28 basis points to invest it. So 0.28%, so less than a third of a percent. It's pretty good. So here I am, you know, being a trust guy, I'm like going, well, how good are they gonna do? Because it grows tax free, right? It's like that educational savings account. So I, on uh, July 2nd, the, I, I don't know what I was doing on the first, but on the second, I opened an account for my daughter and I put like $100 in there. And I said, I'm going to invest it half in the most aggressive and half in the second most aggressive. Let's just see how they did. Um, after about 14 months, it had grown 17.5% tax-free. I can't beat that. I mean, who could beat that? Now, it could have lost money, but I just wanted to see how it did because the market was good, right? The stock market was good. So, yeah, that's net of the investment fees. So even after the 0.28% that we paid, um, 
it grew. And it took a dip in February, like everything else did, but it's back up again. So, what, so ABLE accounts, why would they be important for what you're dealing with? One of the requirements for ABLE accounts are, did I mention, oh, yeah. Sorry, I'm looking to see, it's on a slide coming. It's my next slide, I'll come, I'll come to that in a second. There are limitations on the ABLE accounts. Um, one of the big limitations, which is on the next slide, is that the individual has to, their disability has to have occurred prior to age 26. Why age 26? Anybody know? I don't really know if there was a reason for it. Um, the, the, the most reliable response that I heard from was that they sent it over to like the GAO, I guess the accounting office, to say, we need to know the fiscal impact of this bill, and this is the maximum fiscal impact we want to have. And so they said, well, if you want to have that impact, the numbers we're showing is you can't, you can't allow everybody who's disabled to have one. You have to, if, you, if you limit it at 26, it'll stay within your fiscal impact. So the next step is they're trying to get that age ra raised, but the disability has to have occurred prior to age 26. It doesn't mean the individual has to be 26 when they, under 26 when they set it up. It's only been around two years. I've set up a couple of these accounts for people in their 50s and 60s because the disability was there. There's no question that they were disabled prior to 26. You're dealing with kids, and if they're disabled now, then they're under 26. So that's why, one, why I think this account works really well for you guys, is that it's, one is it's free, <laughs> two is, you, it, I didn't mention, the way you open it is you go online, you can't go to a bank, you go online to ableunited.com, that's Florida's ABLE program, and you open it there, you do it online, and um, you have two choices, you say, okay, it's now open, they said, you want to put some money in it? And if you do, here are your two choices. One is you can send a check. Here's where to mail the check to. We'll deposit it. The other is you can put in your checking account information and we'll let you transfer money into the account. It's pretty simple. It took, takes about 15 minutes to open an account. And it's free. Um, it, has a, it has another limitation, though. You can't put um, over certain limits into it. Now, however, this did change um, in December. So each year there's an annual gift tax exclusion which used to be $10,000 a year and it was set at 10000 I think since 1986 with the tax code and then, and then it started getting indexed a few years back and so it goes up by $1,000 about every three or four years. Last year it was $14,000 um, in December and January it went up to $15,000. So whatever the annual gift exclusion is that's the most you can put into the trust. Even if you're putting the beneficiary's money in, which sounds kind of silly, right? And if I'm, putting my, I'm putting my own money in my account. Why am I limited to the gift tax exclusion? I can see if a grandparent or a parent is putting it in. But the way the gift tax laws work is, grandma can put in, can give 15,000 directly to the child, and grandpa can give 15,000, and all these other people can get it. So it's, 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 by, it's the giver, not the receiver. Well, they made this the receiver. So it's from all sources, it's 15,000 except they made a change that went into effect this year. They want to allow the beneficiary to be able to put some extra money in if they've earned it, meaning they've worked. And so I've got a slide in a, in a few minutes that'll give you how that's calculated and what, um, what those limitations are. So I mentioned you opened up at ableunited.com. The ABLE account is exempted for SSI, for Medicaid, for food assistance, for housing. It's exempted from any program the federal government contributes to. So, su subsidized housing, special needs trusts are only exempted for SSI and Medicaid. They're not exempted for food assistance. They're not exempted for housing, and ABLE accounts are. And as I mentioned, it grows tax-free if it's used for a qualified disability expense. And I know this is kind of small, I'll make it a little bit bigger. Here's the list of all of the qualified disability expenses that are right in the Internal Revenue Code. It's, a, it's almost everything that you could think of, legal fees, and I, don't, I mean it says health, which I'm assuming is medical and all that, prevention and wellness, I'm assuming is prevention of unhealthy things or, or medical issues and wellness. But the last one, basic living expenses. What's a basic living expense? If you, 
because this is a tax code, you have to go to the definition section, and basic living expenses is food, clothing, shelter, basically anything that the individual needs. So you put money in, it grows tax-free, as long as you use it for one of these expenses. What if you don't use it for one of those expenses? You give it to your brother to go on vacation. All right, that's not on there. What's the penalty? What happens? Let's say you give them $500 um, to go on vacation. It's not going to be a great vacation, but it's a, great, it's a vacation. Right? So what's the penalty? What's the effect? It means that if some of that $500 was growth and in income that you were getting tax-free, you now got to pay the tax on that growth. So let's say that it's been doing really well and it did 15%. How much of it is, is growth? I mean, $7? And so you got to report $7 as taxable income. Do you even pay taxes if you're the beneficiary and you're on SSI and Medicaid and these other programs? No. So there's almost no penalty if you don't follow the rules, but you want to follow the rules. Did you have a question? Yeah, kind of. Basic living expenses, can that include recreational things for persons with disabilities? Yeah, can it, can it include recreational things? I guess depending on what it is, but I think a lot of these other things in here are kind of recreational type things. But um, yeah, I mean, health and wellness. I mean, if you like playing sports, could you pay your sports club dues? I think that's kind of it. I don't know what you'd be referring to, but yeah, I think basic living expenses are pretty, pretty broad. So there's all kinds of things that you can use the funds for. So a couple of more things. Oh, wow. That's right. I forgot I zoomed that in. So a couple of other things about, the, about it, which I, I did mention that the disability must have occurred prior to age 26, but um, there's a limit as to how much money you can have in it and have it excluded for SSI purposes. And this is because I wrote this in the federal law. They basically said that the first $100,000 is exempted for Medicaid eligibility purposes, or for SSI, I'm sorry, eligibility purposes, not Medicaid. And if it has more than $100,000, the extra counts. So if you have $101,000, you're still OK if that's all you have, because the limit is $2,000 for SSI. But if you have more than $102,000, your SSI is going to be suspended. And it goes into suspension while the ABLE account is over that limit. You still keep your Medicaid that's tied to the SSI, though. And the reason is that there's a different resource limit for the Medicaid program. And the Medicaid limit is whatever your state's 529 educational savings plan limit is. And in Florida, that's $418,000. So that's going to be a long time, one, before we get ABLE accounts anywhere near those sizes, because you can only put so much in. But if people are max funding these things, um, then there could be a good bit of money in there at some point um, in the future, and we could certainly could venture to the $100,000 figure and get 400 in there would kind of be unusual, I think. As I had mentioned before, there is a Medicaid payback for these ABLE accounts, though, just like the D4A and the D4C. So in January, I was at a conference here, actually, in Orlando. The elder law section had, a, had our annual conference, and, and I was talking with the director of Florida's ABLE program, um, a gentleman named John Finch, and I said, John, have you had anybody die in the program yet? And he said, no, we haven't. It's only been around like a year and a half. So what are you going to do when they die? How are you going to handle that? He's like, we don't know what we're going to do. What we know is that this, the federal law says there's a Medicaid payback on ABLE accounts, but how does that occur? Is the Florida ABLE program, are they going to have to go to the Medicaid and determine how much this, to walk down the hall to the Medicaid agency or whatever from the prepaid college board and say, hey, this person's died, give me the number, and we're going to pay it off, and then what are you going to do with the money when it's left? And he's like, I don't know what we're going to do. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what they ended up doing was they got a, a bill, they got actually put in the budget this legislative session and they addressed what they're going to do with it at least for the, for, for the next year because it, 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 it's a one year law and it goes away July 1st of next year. What they said they're going to do is when a person dies, after all the bills and everything is paid, because you can pay for some things out of an ABLE account after the person has died, anything that's outstanding, if the, if the funeral hasn't been paid for, which that's very different than those, those individual trusts. You can't pay for things after the person has died out of a special needs trust, a D4A or a D4C. 
Of course you can with a third party trust, but you can't with a D4A or D4C. So you can't pay for funeral. You gotta do that ahead of time. You need to prepay it. With ABLE accounts, if they have an ABLE money, you can pay that after the person has died. It says it right in the federal law. Um, but then after all that's done, then what are they doing about the Medicaid? They're going to, they said they're gonna release the money to the estate of the decedent now. So it goes over into the probate estate, which is very different as we were just talking about than a trust recovery is, because the trust money doesn't go to the estate. There's trust law liens that apply um, right off the bat. So they flip it over to the estate and we probate it just like we probate any other assets. And for those of you who don't do much probate, um, a quick little overview of how this would apply. There are eight categories of creditors um, that get paid in the order of the priority. Uh, Medicaid as a state lien with federal priority is a class three creditor. Well, what are one and two? One and two are like lawyer's fees and filing fees, right? Um, you know, two is um, uh, um, funeral expenses up to certain limits, and, and three is Medicaid. So, but the issue is that there are all these exceptions to a Medicaid estate claim. For example, if the person's under the age of 55, there's no Medicaid recovery in an estate. That's different than trust law. So what this means is that for all these people, if they're, for whatever Medicaid services they received under the age of 55 in Florida, there's no Medicaid claim to it. But they only passed it for one year. So it goes into effect July 1st, and it expires next July 1st, and they're trying to make that a permanent thing. So that's ABLE United's next project, next session, is to try to, so what it means is that for many of our individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities that 55 could be on the high end. I mean, that's, that's, that's on the high end of the life expectancy for Down syndrome. I mean, you can get into your 60s, but it's not, at least it's not in the 20s like it used to be, but the, the 40s and 50s is pretty, that's, that's elderly in the Down syndrome world. And so wh how, you, how much are you worried about on a Medicaid lien for those kinds of things? So that's a big deal. That's a really big deal for most of my people that I'm working with. So what it means is that I'm not going to just put maybe $100 in my daughter's account. I actually put more in it. When this passed, I go, well, now it makes sense. I can put more in there because I'm not worried about this Medicaid lien so much. So, well, in that case, yeah, because, yeah, so, so let's say, in that same example, so let's say my daughter passed away and she's got money in her ABLE account, um, she can't do a will, she's not even old enough for one, so it's that even if it's an adult who's never done a will, it, would, it goes to their estate and then our, dis, our intestate statute says who the next closest relative and the heirs are after all the creditors are satisfied. So here are recent changes that occurred in the ABLE, and this was all within the last year. So if you came last year, this is all new. Um, the 15,000 we just talked about is now the annual limit. You can actually roll a 529 plan. So if I did a 529 plan for my son and I didn't use all that up for his college, you can roll it into a 529A plan. You're still limited to $15,000 a year, which sounds kind of silly, but Yes, you can, you can do that. Um, there's that number. Um, so in, in addition to the 15,000, if the individual is working, um, you can contribute up to $12,060 per year if you don't have a defined benefit plan at your employer. And then this is where I'm outside of my comfort zone. And it may be eligible for a federal tax savers credit under the Internal Revenue Code. I don't know all that. But basically you can put some extra money if the beneficiary is working above and beyond the 15000 into the, and that, this was in December, and so then when I, again in January, I'm talking to the director of Florida, I go, how are you guys treating that? He's like, we don't know how to treat that because we can't, we don't, we don't ask for their, their W-2s and their wage and earnings, because right now we're not letting anybody more than 15000 put money in, but that was in January, so now they're, I'm sure they have a policy and a plan now for how they do it. And then I mentioned this one here, that basically Florida has waived Medicaid recovery from ABLE accounts and remaining funds will go to the estate of the beneficiary just for a year, and who knows how it's going to happen after that. If third party is setting up an ABLE's account, can they designate a beneficiary? It's a great question. If, if a third party is putting money into an ABLE account, can they designate a beneficiary? And the answer is no. Not in Florida. The, the, the ABLE account is considered the beneficiary's money. 
Special needs trusts are not. So the different, different way you have to look at it, the special needs trusts, yes, a third party, a person can put money in trust and designate beneficiaries, but once you put it into an ABLE account, that's considered that disabled person, whether they have capacity or not, um, it's their money, it's their account. It just happens to be exempted for eligibility for these programs. Yes? Is the question is, is there a limit as to when you can start to use it? The answer is no. You can use it right off the bat. Yeah. And the way you access it is one of two ways. And, they may, and they're talking about a third way. I don't think they've done it yet. Um, the third way is a debit card that, that the, the state of Florida is talking about giving the beneficiary because it's their money. They can do whatever they want with it, basically. Um, the way that it has been, I think it still is, is you can go online. You can request a payment of a, ch a check. You can say, I want to pay, you know, um, for whatever, I'm going to pay my rent, whatever, um, $500, and they'll mail a check if you want them to mail a check. They'll, they, they used to say, and I don't know if they've changed their policy, they did two a month for free, and every check after that, they were going to charge $5. Um, the other way is, remember I said you can, can link it to a bank account, and you can actually slurp it back into that same account if you want to. So whether it's the beneficiary's account, if they happen to have a bank account, then the beneficiary in theory, can go online, pull the money right out of the ABLE account, put it into their bank account to still use it. When they pull it out of the ABLE account and they put it into their account, it's not income to them because it's just moving from one of their pockets to another pocket. It's still exempted. And then it has to be used for one of those qualified disability expenses or, what's the penalty? You've got to pay the tax on the growth, which is nothing. Did you have a question? Is there a specific requirement of accounting, maybe on an annual basis? Is there a question? Well, uh, okay, well, that's a good question if you're talking about guardianship. Are you talking about the ABLE account specifically or the trust? How is the accounting managed? I mean, how do they know you're spending the money? Right, how do, it's a great question. How do they know you're spending the money? Monthly, the state of Florida has to provide a statement to the Internal Revenue Service. So they get it. What does the IRS care about any of this? It's a tax free account. I bet they don't even by looking at it. The only people that are, which is, this is where it's interesting, because it's a tax law, it doesn't make sense. They put it, that the IRS doesn't care about people on SSI and Medicaid. Social Security does. Social Security determines your SSI eligibility. They would be very interested in whether you're using the money correctly or not, except there's no provision for one for them to even get statements or accountings. The prepaid college doesn't provide it to Social Security. It goes to the IRS. And two, if, if it's used for something incorrectly, it doesn't taint the ABLE account. There's no SSI issue. Now, if you, if you pull the money out and you don't use it for one of those qualified disability expenses ever, at some point, it starts counting as a resource in your bank account, which is bad, and then you could lose your benefit. But the fact of whether you, if you take it out and you use it for something you're not entitled to use it for, it has no effect on your SSI. It really doesn't. It's a good question. Yeah, I, I think it's a great question, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm not positive of the answer, but does an ABLE account need to be accounted for in a, under a guardianship? I, I think the answer is yes, because clearly it is the beneficiary's money, and it's not a trust where you can get trusts excused from accounting and, and, and reporting if, if there's a, because you know, a trust is considered a lesser restrictive alternative to a guardian of the property, at least for those assets. So you can sometimes get trust accountings waived. But, um, but no, I, I think for ABLE, you've got to provide, um, if, if the person's under a guardianship, I do think you need to account for. Do you need court permission to set up an ABLE account in a, in a guardianship? and your judge might want it to be restricted. It's not a trust. Do you need it to open a bank account in the name of the beneficiary of, of your ward? No, I don't think so. It's not one of the specific. I don't know, it's an interesting question because we always say, if you've got a guardian, go ask the court, and I can't imagine the court saying, no, you can't do it. But there is a con question, because he's able accounts, try to find the word able all by itself in, seven, in 744, it's not there. So I don't know, able accounts are, are still very, very new. I got one in the back, and then I'll come back to you too. Oh wait. Yes. Um, and <coughs> I guess I have two different parts to this. Like, I'm not sure whether that money that they're earning from Social Security is in their national trust probably can't be used unless it's SSD money or if it's a child of a, someone. But let's say who would open it up for them? If they don't have 
right? It's a great question. And you know what? I knew that was going to be asked. In fact, I sat out front just to, right before the beat started, and I looked for the answer. And, and the answer hasn't changed from when it was originally set up. Um, it's not real clear, but what it says is the individual can set it up or a representative of theirs, which it says a parent, a guardian, or an agent under a power of attorney. That's it. You probably don't have those in many of your cases. A court, uh, you'd, have to, you'd have to petition the court, but you're going to get the court to be doing it as a standalone if, it's, if there's no guardianship. It doesn't say court in that list. Now, having said that, I don't think they're going to give you a hard time if you've got a court, but then who are you going to appoint to be the representative to do it, you know, to, to administer it and to oversee it? It's considered the beneficiary's money, and as soon as they turn 18, whether they have capacity or not, they're going to be presumed to have that ability to control, and then at that point, then you would need to get a guardian if they really, truly were disabled or incapacitated. Or guardian advocate, yeah. So, kind of visualize the kind of client that's going to show up that's going to have the money to self-fund this every year. It sounds like mainly it's going to be some third party directing the funds into the account. And so, if those funds were to pay directly for the same kind of benefits, is there really a, a benefit? Well, if, if is there a benefit? Yeah, and this is, there's a technical, it gets hyper-technical here for a second, and, and, I, and I'm going to refer to that, and I'm going to explain, um, it's, um, it's this one here. I'm putting it over here next to it, the one that says, can you? So, I don't, know, I don't know if you can see that. It is in the materials that's online, but here. So what I did was I, I wanted to do a comparison of these three kinds of trusts with an ABLE account. Third party, D4A, D4C, and an ABLE. And so the, the question is, if the third party is the one who's going to be doing it, is it just as, isn't it just as easy for them to pay the bills and things directly rather than putting it into an ABLE account? And on first blush, the answer would be yes, that if you're going to pay for it, let's, let's do that. But maybe they want to, to pay for it and they want to save for it too. So maybe that's one as an alternative to a trust. But this is when it gets a bit technical. Under SSI, Supplemental Security Income, and only under SSI, and no other social security programs, and not Medicaid, and not Medicaid waiver, and not any of these others, but under SSI, the maximum benefit is $750 a month. It is designed for the individual's food and shelter. There are nine specific shelter expenses in the, in the regulations, and there's food. So there's 10 expenses. If anybody, including an able, or including a trust, or a grandparent or a parent or someone pays for food or shelter for that person on SSI, that's called in-kind support, and it can diminish their SSI benefit by a maximum of a third if you pay the bill directly. So I got a kid in an apartment, and it's a thousand bucks, and I want to pay the thousand dollars. That's in-kind support because that person, in my example, is on SSI, so they're going to lower their benefit by about $260 or so because it's in-kind support. If I pay it directly, if I put it into a third-party trust, even if there's a D4A or a D4C trust, the individual's money already, and it pays that $1,000, we're going to lower their benefit, not if it goes through an ABLE account specifically in the Social Security regulations and in the uh, ABLE POMS that says payments for food and shelter out of an ABLE account is not considered in-kind support and maintenance. It's the beneficiary's money. So in my example, I put that $1,000 into an ABLE account every month. That's $12,000 a year. I'm still under my limit. You use that 1000 to pay the rent. You don't diminish their SSI at all. That's a huge potential in that example, the third party. But you're right, you can still do third party trusts. You don't get the tax-free growth. Okay, so what, if you're only putting a few thousand dollars in it, the, the tax-free growth isn't a big deal. The ABLE has, has tax-free growth, but you can pay for those things. And, and if you look at it, it's the only one that's green. If you pay for food and shelter out of any of these other accounts, it counts 
against them for SSI purposes. So there's a potential benefit there on doing it. This is complex. This is confusing stuff. Food and shelter is a big one. Yeah, and 750 doesn't cut it. So we do the best we can, and if you could do an ABLE account, we have beneficiaries of our special needs trust because we administer all of these kinds. If they have an ABLE account and they're on SSI, we're funding $1,250, up to $1,250 a month into their ABLE accounts to be able to be used for food and shelter with no diminishing of their SSI. The new Social Security, Palms that came out this week says you can do that without issue. It's clear now. Before we thought you could do it, now we know you can do it. So that's in here. The other thing that they addressed in here are survivors benefit plans through the VA. So when you have your veterans who have passed away and if they want to name their, their disabled child as a beneficiary, it talks about how to irrevocably assign that to a D4A or a D4C trust. It does not count as income in determining whether the child can qualify for SSI if they're on SSI or Medicaid if they're on a Medicaid program. And I'm happy to keep answering questions, but I think we are at 2 o'clock. So if you want to come up after um, when we're done, and I'm happy to continue to answer questions. But otherwise, I thank you all for your time. Thank you.